This is the story of the calming of the waters, uh, of Jesus telling the, the lake to calm down, to be quiet, to be still. Such an inspiring story that it actually became the symbol for the Royal Council of Churches, the symbol of faith. Where is your faith? How, why don't you believe this yet? So let's bring it back to the scripture, because the scripture is, is one of those rare times when, when Mark gives us a little more detail. Usually he's rush, 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 and we don't have a whole lot of time just sit and wait and look at what's going on around us. But he talks about Jesus being asleep in the boat. So it's at the end of the day. He has been preaching from a boat because the crowds have been along the shoreline, and they've been blocking him out. So he has had to be in the boat teaching. And... Uh, teaching about the community of God, teaching about um, how to understand God's promise, um, how we're supposed to behave with each other, how we're supposed to be family with each other. And his followers are there trying to probably keep the crowd back and, and keep him safe and keep him, keep him where he needs to be so he can do his work. And they've watched him. They've watched him do this teaching. They've had their own private teachings, explanations that the crowd hasn't received. They've watched him do healings. And now it's the end of the day. He is exhausted. And he says, let's go to the other side. And it seems so innocuous. But if you're a first century fisher person, he is essentially, Jesus has essentially asked them to risk their lives simply to cross over the Sea of Galilee. And like good followers, they do. Before we get into more of the scripture, I have to set the stage because this is not a, an easy ask from Jesus. Um, the, the Sea of Galilee uh, was known for its gales and storms. Fishing was not an easy task. It wasn't as simple as it's going out in your dinghy and throwing a line over the edge and sitting all day. This was a dangerous job. They were going out in nighttime and there's a lot of theories as to why night is a, a better time to fish, um, that the fish are more active, that the moon brings them to the surface, that they can't see the, um, the material of the net, so they're a little more free to move around. Um, unless a scientist is on here that can explain it better, I, I haven't got anything uh, better to explain about that. But it was the way it was done. And after they fished at night, they would come ashore, and they would clean everything, they would prepare everything, and they would sell in the market. And the market was controlled by the, um, those in authority, the rich, um, those who had power. So fisher folk really were not their own people, their own independence. They might have had their own boat. Um, they might even have been part of a, a factory co-op in some ways. But they really were dictated by someone else. And here they have their, their leader, their rabbi, their teacher, saying, let's go across. So on one hand, this is just yet one more person in authority says, okay, this is what we're going to do. And so they go out and do it. Whether they wanted to or not is immaterial. It was going to be done. And there were several boats set out from the shore to contain all of Jesus' followers. And the assumption is always that these are seasoned fisher folk who understand the water. And the truth is only a third of Jesus' named followers had any experience being in the boats. So they might not have been the ones in the boat with Jesus. When the storm came up and it was night and it was dark and they couldn't see the land and they might not have been able to see each other very well. And they had to figure out how to respond to the storm. And Jesus is just sleeping away, which, you know, if you've ever slept in anything with motion, um, you have to have a certain level of, of relaxation and trust in who is driving in order to do that. So Jesus trusted these fisher folk to get him to the other side. And it was not something he was even terribly concerned about. And that was the point where the fisher folk really, the, the people in the boat with him were really upset. And they knew they knew that he had this additional power. See, the thing in the first century is that there were a lot of Messiah-type characters. There were a lot of leaders who had disciples around them who um, were reputed to do miraculous things, who were reputed to teach great and wonderful and in-depth lessons about the world around them and about what God wants. So Jesus, in that capacity, was not unique. There were probably hundreds 
in the region of Galilee and Judea who actually fell into that category. And the legends around them would have been huge. But this is the first time the disciples have to really experience panic when they're with him. And they wake him up. Why are you not concerned with us? If you're such a miracle worker, if you're so wonderful, why aren't you helping us? And Jesus just stands up, ignores them for the moment, and talks to the sea. Be quiet. And he rebukes them. He said, be still. That was the first time out of all the things that they had seen Jesus do thus far, that was the first time that they'd actually watched him do something that was not part of a reputation of any other rabbi, any other leader who was a, a wandering person with disciples with them. And they were scared. There is, I, I, they probably were more scared of Jesus' response than they were of the storm at that point. Because here was someone who calmed the sea. And it's really the first miracle that the disciples encounter. And it's one of those challenging miracles that we, in all our 21st century wisdom, cannot explain. And we like to explain these things. It's, we look at miracles the same way we look at magicians. You know, we, we like to know what the card tricks are and that the magician has something up their sleeve or they've been counting or they have a system. We like to know that when the woman gets into the box to be cut in half, that there's actually two women curled up in there and the knife goes through the two separate boxes so the woman is never actually in danger. It's just the illusion of it. We like to know that. With Jesus, we like to know that if he healed someone, it was just using medical practice that was not well known, or he was helping them emotionally and mentally, because everything was demon-possessed at that point in time if they didn't understand what it was. We want to know that the miracle of the, of the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 was because the people in the crowd saw that someone was sharing and so they started sharing too and that was the miracle that people actually got over themselves and shared things but the miracle of calming the sea is something we cannot explain away there's no logic to it we understand winds coming through we understand mountain ranges we understand water basins that are just magnets for storms we understand all that we understand fear but we do not understand how Jesus was able to calm the storm with just words. In first century Palestine, that was a sign. Only God could rebuke chaos. And they believed that the waters, the storms, were an act of chaos on the land. And it's the first time the disciples really truly have to face that there is something really special about this guy. There's something that is beyond understanding. And he asks them, where is your faith? And you almost want to say, Jesus, come on. You're not done anything yet that any other people haven't done. We feel you're special, but other people have a reputation for doing what you do too. Where is your faith? And really that is the ultimate question to take out of this scripture and move into our modern day, because we can't explain how the water got stilled. A true encounter of faith is scary. It changes us. There's, there's nothing we can do to understand it. We can't explain it away. We like to be able to be in control. We like to know things. That's one of the reasons we've got such a, a rich history of English, uh, sorry, of Christian theology in all languages, because we as a people want to know. It, we want to have it in bites that are explainable to us. Even if we aren't an expert on the subject matter, just knowing that someone else has figured it out matters to us. And we can't figure this one out. So it becomes a very uncomfortable story. It becomes a story of our faith as well. Where is our faith? The thing with miracles and the thing with faith is it changes us. And change is scary. Change means that anything that we're used to is not going to be the same anymore. It means any experience we have is going to, to so morph 
how we perceive things, that we cannot carry on the way we used to. And given the option, most of us would say, no, thanks, we don't want that. We, we got our world sorted. We know what's what. We don't want to rock the boat, literally and figuratively. We don't want to have anything different than what we have. Even when we go through the motions of faith, we might sing the hymns, we might do the prayers, we might attend service, we might listen to the speakers, but we don't necessarily want to believe because belief means opening ourselves up to change. And especially if you have been a cradle Christian, so someone raised in the faith, you are comfortable and you don't want anything. And yeah, occasionally someone will come along that kind of makes you think about things differently and push some buttons, makes you uncomfortable, makes you, makes you wonder really if the way you've always looked at something is how it should always be looked at. That level of, of controllable change is okay. But to genuinely change, to genuinely have that experience where you are forced to look at the world a different way, we don't want that. Jesus could be asking us, just as honestly as he was asking his followers in the first century, where is your faith? Because faith is risk. And risk means opening ourselves up to things we don't know and can't understand and can't control. And we, for the most part, are not prepared to do that. Even people in ministry, they don't go in without knowing what's going to happen. Because they usually have this entire group of people around making sure they're comfortable. Priests are a very comfortable group of people. They have their faith in controllable bites. To truly let go is something that takes an enormous amount of trust in something that is oftentimes far beyond anything we can conceive of trusting in. I'm not going to give you any words of wisdom. I can't give you any personal experience. I can't give you any anything that it will help you develop that faith. It is hard, as simple and basic as Christianity is. The act of true faith is hard. It is challenging. It is being forced to the wall where there's no other options, and now you have to take that leap. That's what Jesus was asking the disciples in that boat all that long ago when he was able to do things that none of us can explain away. All I can invite you to do is remain uncomfortable, remain disquieted, remain wondering, as the disciples did, who is this person that even the sea obeys? Who is this person that we follow? Who is he to me, and how am I going to respond? What does faith even look like? There are no easy answers, and that's kind of why we talk about this as a journey. Who is this guy? 